uh, brought to you today by the Sabian Education Network. I'm really, really excited to have three eminent gentlemen who are top of their game, pros who I've looked up to for a long time and have had the pleasure of getting to know here in the New York area uh, in the Broadway scene. And they're here to talk about that scene working on Broadway today. Um, again, brought to you by the Sabian Education Network, but we're going to talk about everything regarding playing. All questions are on the table. Uh, and so I'm really happy that they have joined me today. So by way of introduction, uh, we got kind of like Hollywood Squares. I was reminded that a lot of our younger viewers don't even know what that is. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, to my to my right, we have Mr. Sean McDaniel. And Sean Hello. was... Hey, Sean, thanks for being here. Sean is uh, currently the drummer at Disney's Frozen, principal drummer at the hit show Book of Mormon. And he also was the original drummer at Hamilton when it was started at the Public Theater in New York City. And um, all the guys have played many, many other shows as a sub and workshops and stuff like that. But just I'm just giving you the highlights so we can get started. Um, below Sean, Gary Seligson. Hey, Gary. Hey there. Uh, Gary was the original drummer at Wicked. And Phil Collins heard him play and loved it so much that he handpicked him to be the drummer at Tarzan. And he was also the drummer at Aida and uh, the wonderfully fun show School of Rock. So uh, among many other shows. And Larry Lelly, below hey. me. Hey, Larry. Hey. Larry, uh, long time. Uh, and all these gentlemen are Sabian artists, Sabian endorsers. Larry is a very long time. Uh, how many years you've been with Sabian, Larry? Since 1990. That's that's wow. a few How many years is that. <laughs> that's so uh, twenty years, right? Thirty. Thirty years. That would be thirty. Thirty. 30. Oh my God! <laughs> All this time at home, the brain is going. Gary, how long have you been with Sabian? Yeah, around the same amount. I think ninety-one. Wow, that's great. Yeah, long I mean, time. You guys, I, I, we're all around the same time. And Sean, you're been five over, years. Five years. Five years. Okay. Born in nineteen. <laughs> so, um, so getting back to Larry's resume, Larry um, was uh, the drummer for the immense hit, The Producers, and also was the drummer, among other shows, Million Dollar Quartet and How to Succeed in Business. That was the one that was Daniel Radcliffe was in, right? Yeah, right. And also is currently the drummer at uh, another hit show, Come From Away. So all experts uh, and guys, thanks again. So let's dive right in. And I want to go one at a time. And uh, I know this question could easily take up the hour and we'll, uh, uh, and gentlemen, just so you know, Andy Zildjian is with us today. Yeah, he's, called, he's just called you guys a bunch of budding legends. <laughs> Not sure what to make of that. But. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll leave that right there. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll leave it. <laughs> Thanks for being with us, Andy. It's an honor. Um, so Sean, let's start with you. I know this could take up the whole time, but just a brief synopsis of, how you got to Broadway. So you're, you know, coming out of, and I know in your case, it was a uh, music education, whether it was college or whatever, how did you get into it and how did you make your way into Broadway and what was your first show? And um, Well, it's, it's funny that Gary and Larry are both here because they both had a lot to do with it. Um, I first met Gary when I was really young and he was touring with the show Les Mis and my parents would always take me to see the shows that came through Dallas and I'd go down to the pit and try to wave at the drummer and you know i just happened to see gary all the time on les mis and he's back with miss saigon um so i kind of got to know him when i was a kid and this was before you know facebook and email so it was harder to keep up with people you had to do it face to face or calling them and then uh during college i was an intern at the local theater i went to university of north texas and there was a theater where all the tours came through which is another place i saw gary but then also larry was there subbing on les mis one time so i met him there so when I moved to New York, I had a few people like these guys to call and, you know, just say, hey, I'm here. And I was in grad school and um, I started playing gigs off Broadway, subbing at uh, theaters regionally, playing in bands, all kinds of things. And um, Gary was playing Aida at the time and he needed a new sub and he asked me to come watch. And at, at the end of it, he said, is this something you can do? And I was thinking in my head, no, this is impossible. I could never do this. It's, it's so hard. <laughs> And um, and I was like, yeah, I'll do it. And so I had just graduated uh, from NYU. So I took a month and I set up his exact setup in my studio and basically memorized the whole show and um, had to go in and play for him uh, just the first act. It was kind of like an audition. You play the first half and if you're good enough, you can come back and play the second half another time. And um, I passed that test. So I, I got to start subbing there. 
And so Gary gave me that first opportunity, which, you know, it's like, I'll always be grateful for that. And right after Gary, Larry started having me sub at producers and it just kind of snowballed where I was subbing on um, 11 shows at one time. And after two and a half years of that, I got offered my first show, which was Spam A Lot, the Monty Python show. And, and that came through Michael Keller, the contractor, because he had heard about me subbing on a lot of his shows. So I know it's different for everyone, but that's kind of a snapshot of, of, how, of how it worked. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, subbing on, for people who don't know, sh- subbing on a couple of Broadway shows at once is stressful. 11 shows at one time. <laughs> yeah, that's, all I can say is, Sean, you are clearly a masochist. <laughs> well, I was a lot younger then, a lot yeah. younger. It, it, it really is an amazing uh, level of skill that you have to, to pull oh, that thanks. off. It's amazing. Gary, you next. What, tell us about your way in. Okay. Uh, I just want to say that when I when I heard Sean play Aida in the first act at his studio, it was unbelievably dead on, and that uh-huh. was, there was no click tracks back in those days, and there was incremental tempo changes and a lot of specific stuff with the Octopad and, and the SPD twenty. Sean was so on fire that it was blatantly obvious, <laughs> and then when he played the show, the the report from the conductor and everyone it was like bring sean back yes. <laughs> well there's that uh which is why um he i don't know it was amazing really really amazing but my story is uh i was i went to a conservatory hard school of music i studied with alexander Leepak. he gave me a really he's a great teacher and a great composer and he gave me a very well-rounded education i played a lot of big band stuff while i was there and then uh graduating from there that summer I happened upon the article in Modern Drummer with Gary Chester. And when I read that article with Gary Chester, I thought, well, God, let's see. I'm coming to New York. I knew I wanted to go to New York. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. But Gary at that time was talking about the studio work that he had done, and Weckl was a student of his. He really turned me on in that article so much that I called him up as soon as I got into town. And he said, well, it's going to be a bit of a wait. Anyway, I started studying with him. And his approach was really unusual. And I was very inspired. It was, you know, drumming in a different way that I'd never done before. And one day after about the sixth or seventh lesson, he said, well, so what do you want? To, what do you, you know, you ever think about playing on Broadway? And I said, well, I've thought about it, but I don't know how to go about it. He said, well, my student is, I have a student, Howard Joins, he told him, yeah, uh, who has a show. I'm going to tell him about you. You call him on Thursday. I think it was on Monday. He's, you call him Thursday, I'm gonna see him tomorrow, and he's gonna have you in as a sub. Well, long story short, that is what happened. I called him and Howie said, Howie, by the way, is a, you know, one of the guys who's had a show forever, meaning like 30 years, and now he's a prominent contractor and a, and a good friend of all of ours. I don't know. Uh, anyway, Howie gave me a show. It took a couple of months. How, what's what's say, Larry? And anyway, another saving. Took, yeah, that's right. It took a couple of months. Uh, before he got me in and I got, I went in there, I played, it was successful. And as soon as that happened, the ball started rolling similar to what Sean's seen as, um, I was subbing on a few different shows at radio city, uh, for a summer show they had there and a little shop of horrors. And then I got called to my contractor to go on the road with a show. And that sounded very exotic to me. And it was a lot more money than I was making working around the city. At that point I was playing in bands and playing bar mitzvahs and weddings and, just jobbing around um, and playing some theater gigs. But suddenly someone said, well, you can make $1,500 a week or whatever it was at the time and go to Mil- exotic Milwaukee and, you know, don't worry. Me. And that sounded great to me. So I did that and one tour felt turned into another. I loved it. I had my car on the road. I stayed on the road for like nine years solid at one point. And it's, so it was uh, in the beginning, it was on your toes and then cats and then Les Mis for five years. That's when I met Sean. And then Miss Saigon for about two and a half years. And then I came back to New York and started subbing again. I was lucky that a lot of people I worked with through those nine years were in this, on the scene. So I kind of came in seamlessly there and started subbing. I played at Chicago first. That went really well. Then Lion King had just opened up. And I didn't even want to sub for Tommy Igo because I figured everyone in the world was calling him. Oh, can you guys still hear Gary or? No, he's frozen for me. Okay. Um, let's give it a second. If he says, yes. Oh, okay. We, uh, he might have, we might have to, he might have to uh, come back in. 
Okay. Um, let's go. So uh, we'll, we'll bring Barry back on to finish his story. So Larry, let's uh, let's go ahead and move to you. Um, okay. What's your? Uh, I had no real intention for playing Broadway when I was learning, you know, to play drums and growing up. Um, I went to college at the University of Wisconsin in Eau Claire and was a total jazz head. I thought I was going to move to New York and play bebop and big bands and all that kind of stuff. But by the time I got out of school, there was not a lot of that kind of work. So I moved to Minneapolis for a few years where there was a lot of that kind of work and I played there for a little bit, but I was frustrated that there wasn't more of a national scene and it felt a little limited. So I moved to Nashville on a whim, uh, went and played uh, what they call the songwriter circle. I went and sat in on one of those songwriter circles. Somebody heard me. I got an audition for Faith Hill the next day. I mean, things just were really lucky for me. And I was on the road for three years in Nashville and kind of burning out. And I met a guy on a cruise ship on a jazz cruise who lived in New York and happened to play bass for crazy for you. And he said, man, what are you doing? You know, you're playing in Nashville, you, you're like a really great musician and you can play all the percussion instruments and you know how to conduct, you know, you should play Broadway shows in New York. You, you sleep in your own bed every night and you make good money and it's a really fun scene. And so I just started visiting New York on weekends when I was off from touring with Doug Stone in Nashville and I started to meet cats. Uh, the guy Chuck Bergeron was his name, a bassist. He would introduce me to a few Broadway drummers every weekend I would come up and I'd just go sit in the pit and I've started thinking, wow, this is really cool. And I love this, I could totally get into this. And so I, I just decided on a whim to move to New York for three months and see what would happen. And I luckily through a friend of a friend of a friend met the percussionist who was playing at Miss Saigon. He was desperate for subs at the time. I had nothing going on. I couldn't get arrested in New York because nobody knew who I was. And he said, what do you think? Do you think you could play this show? I'm really desperate for a sub and everybody keeps getting fired and I can't seem to get anybody to say yes. It's such a terrifying thing. And I said, yeah, why not? I'll give it a shot. And so I did basically what Sean did. I went and practiced that book eight hours a day, five days a week until I basically had it memorized. And then I went in and played my first show for this show for Miss Saigon. Miss Saigon. You don't get an audition, you don't get rehearsal or anything. You just go in and play your show. Hey, Larry, hang on a second. Gary, do you have, um, we're getting like an echo, I think, from your end. Oh, oh poor Gary. Uh, Gary's having trouble. <laughs> oh. Sorry, Larry, so go on, Larry, sorry. Anyway, I, I practiced, I did just what Sean did, which is what you have to do if you want to sub on a Broadway show. Uh, you have to come in and you have to nail it perfectly the first time. Otherwise, you might not get asked back a second time. The competition is so stiff and fierce. You've got to be amazing right away. Mm -hmm. And luckily I nailed it the first show and Broadway community is so small and tight. If you do really well on one very difficult show, your name is going to go around like fire really quickly. And it was probably the next week I had my next call from another drummer saying, Hey, I heard you killed it over at Miss Saigon. You want to come and learn beauty and the beast. And then it just snowballed from there. And, I, Sean and I had very similar paths, how we were subbing and got into the scene. I was doing up to nine books at the time. Gary's back. All right, okay. sorry, that was, whole, that was a whole thing. Sorry, guys. Yes. So Gary, Larry's gonna finish up and then we'll come back to you. Yeah, of course. so basically that was it. Um, and how I got my first show was I was subbing a show called Jekyll and Hyde, and that drummer left that show to go start another show, and they asked me to take over the chair. So that's, that's another way that you can get into being a full, full-time regular chair holder on Broadway. Okay, Gary can finish up now. <laughs> <laughs> that's so, you know, so when I met Tommy Igo, I was already subbing a couple of shows and um, he said, well, come learn this. And I watched him in the pit, which is what you need to do. Uh, you probably, people who are watching this maybe know that. So you sit next to the drummer and you watch him and you record it somehow where he gives you these days they give might give you a Dropbox link with the music and an audio recording and basically like Larry and Sean said, you work your butt off learning the show to the best of your ability. So and then it's trial by fire when you get your first crack. And so Tommy said to me so while I was sitting next to him that Saturday night, um, he said, Well, this is how it's gonna work. I'm gonna be out of I'm gonna be out of here a lot. And 
you're sitting here now. There's a few other people that have watched this thing, but you just saw the New York Times review. It's going to be a big hit. I'm going to be gone a lot. And this is the way whoever the conductor of Joe Church likes the most is going to get the most of, most of the work. So for me, that was all I needed to hear. And so I proceeded to transcribe everything that he played. And then I played it back on the gig and did that a few times. And they were very happy. And fast forward a couple of months into it, um, unbeknownst to me, one day Michael Keller, who's a prominent contractor, had uh, another show, Aida it was, um, and he asked the conductor who his favorite drum sub, who's doing a great job for Tommy these days, and Joe Church mentioned my name, and then the phone rang, and I said yes to Aida, and that really started, suddenly I had my own show that was a Disney show, it was pretty successful, and that led into all the other shows basically that I've I think Gary's frozen again. Yeah. I think he's having some connection issues there. Well, the the thing that I think is the the um the skill set. I think you know. Oh uh, no! Uh, okay. uh, I guess I guess he's having. So maybe it's the the weather here. It's starting to get bad. Um, so I think the one thing that we all have in, uh, you know seen with this that you guys all had in common with this is that you when you get your chance after you've networked and, and you do get your chance, you have to deliver the goods and you have to do it the first time. Um, mm -hmm. It's not a place where you get, you know, second chances so much. So And there's no rehearsal. You, your right. first show is your is your rehearsal and your performance at the same time and your audition. So it's, it's really scary. Totally. And it's very difficult because you've never sat in that very drum throne hearing things in that exact way, seeing the conductor from that exact angle it's it's really a hot seat, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, you're. I know we get very finicky about our setups. When you go and you play, you know, you can't move anything. It's like you have to play the drums the way they are. And if you're not comfortable, you just need to adapt. And it really, you know, makes you prioritize what you need to focus on, and it gets you used to being adaptable very quickly. Well, either I that used or to have. I used to have to bring extra long sticks to play Les Mis because. <laughs> I'm only five five, and so everybody that I'm sub for is usually taller. And for some reason, lame as I couldn't reach anything, so I used swizzles for the whole show because they're like seventeen inches. And I would bring my own seat that I could adjust um, closer because he had a weird tripod thing. That was Bill Lanham. I'll always appreciate that opportunity. Um, but that's just you know you you can't move anything because if I, as a regular, I know if I come back in after being gone and something's moved like a quarter of an inch, I know, and it like throws off the whole show. So when you're sub, you want to be invisible, you know, not leaving, um, you know, coffee cups around and stuff like that. It's also, you can't move the setup because we're usually in a booth or in the pit and it's very close quarters and everything is close mic'd. It's set up exactly so that the sound can be the same every single night. So you can't take your snare drum and angle it somewhere differently because now the snare drum mic is going to be off or move the hi-hat out or move, you know, you just can't do it. You have to be able to, to come in and play on whatever setup. Mm -hmm. yeah. Totally. I have a, I have, hi, welcome back. I have a really, <laughs> a really good story for that. So when I, I was studying with Gary Chester and the first time I ever played a Broadway show was for Howie Joins. So I watched him play it. Uh, he said, he said, just call me when, when you have it down and I'll try to get you in here. Well, I called him and he, when he finally got me in there, it was a Saturday night and it was the old Brenner on stage. It was King and I, and really quickly what happened was, I, I had never thought to sit on Howie's drum set. And at that point, so and and his drum set was facing the stage. And it was not a deep pit. I forget the theater, but it was not, Sean probably knows. But it, it was a shallow pit, and the drums were facing the stage. So I sat down there at about 5.30 on Saturday night to play the 8 o'clock show. And as soon as I sat down with the drums, I noticed, A, how high he was sitting, which was, about a foot higher than I ever sat, and B, his bass drum pedal was so tight, the the action was so tight that I I couldn't believe it. it was, and and you know, thinking back, I think Howie was doing a lot of weightlifting. I think he was. He was trying to train his calf muscle while he was playing. The show. He was I think so. I think that's why. Anyway, so I played for about thirty seconds in the pit at five thirty. I get thirty seconds into it and. The door opens up, a big pit door opens up, and there's an irate dresser, age, 
and she's yelling at me. She says, what are you doing? I'm like, well, I'm playing tonight for the first time. I'm trying to get acclimated. She's like, no, no, no. People are sleeping. You can't. No <laughs> boys. You're not allowed to be here. Get out of here. I was like, really? I didn't know any of this. Anyway, point of the story is that I came back. So I walked around Midtown for about an hour, and I got more nervous every 10 <laughs> seconds. Uh, and when I finally got back in there at uh, oh, good hanger. Uh, <laughs> um, so, hey, Joe, Dom, Dom Familero is just chimed in and he had a good question about reusability. Yes. I, I actually wanted to go to you guys one at a time, and Andy yeah. had another question too. Okay. So, I actually wanted to say, what are the other skills besides being a great player? What are the other skills that you guys felt helped you get in and then let you get more work? So, Larry, why don't you take that first? Yeah, M most importantly, is you've got to be able to be a chameleon. You have to be able to play every single style. And not only that, come in and recreate the style and the feel and the sound that that drummer that you're going to be subbing for is already producing in the pit because everybody's used to that. The conductor, the whole band, the dancers on stage, everybody's going to chime in if they hear one different little thing. So that's why Sean and I were so successful in, and Gary in subbing because we really were able to be flexible, be a chameleon, come in and hear that sound of that player and then reproduce it ourselves when we went into sub for the first time. Mm -hmm. What about you, Sean? What would you describe as the important, important um, skills? That, that's definitely important, being able to do all the styles. Um, and recently, you know, in the past maybe 10 or 15 years, every show has a click track. So I think playing with a click needs to be something you're totally comfortable with and being able to make the music feel good with the click, not, not like uh, not robotic or anything. Um, so you want you have to when you're subbing that's a hard thing because you have to find out where the drummer is placing it with the clicks that's another thing as, as you're subbing but when you're regular you do your own thing and you just you just want it to feel good and i think that's a thing um record yourself with a click and practice with the click and really get comfortable with it so that you know and it's, it's just the thing that you don't really work on in school or i didn't at least mm -hmm. yeah. yeah it's definitely ubiquitous now and you have to be able to do it well um so let's talk about what Don said. People always do ask me, you have to be a great reader, right? And the interesting thing is when you're subbing, it's prepared reading. You're not sight reading anything. As a matter of fact, you practiced it to the hilt. You're barely reading it anymore. But reading is still important, right? Gary, do you see reading as being important? If you're still not frozen? Oh, he might still be frozen. Sean, uh, Sean can um, you? I think, I think it is, um, but in other ways, like it's rare that I'll have to read a really intricate drum part and sight read it. Uh, if you're subbing on a show, you'll be able to get the music and you could even learn it by ear if you wanted to. And and so much, so little is written down that you're usually transcribing a lot and learning by ear anyway. But the, the part we're reading is coming most handy for me is when I'm doing developing a new show and yeah. you have to read piano music. So if you can be able to read two rhythms at once, so it's like you can know the right hand's on the top staff and the bass room's gonna play the bottom staff, those rhythms come in really handy to be able to read those and to know harmony and, and things like that so you can follow a piano chart or a lead sheet that kind of reading is, is really helpful but also drum set reading is definitely important and there are sessions where you have to do it and sometimes you're not on a show where you develop so you have to come and just read drum parts so all reading is important like you definitely need the skill but as a sub i would say it's not your most important thing because you're usually not reading that much of the ink or, or you're, you're transcribing it or you're you can prepare it, like you said you can take as long as you want right yeah i'll add on to that if go you ahead. go yeah, you, um, you also need to, to do have reading chops. You need to have reading chops as a sub because oftentimes during shows, things might go wrong and a conductor might need to give a cue like out of a vamp or, or make everybody hold in a vamp longer. And so the thing that you may have learned when you were at home re rehearsing the show on your own, it might not be exactly the same. And so you can't just be playing what you memorized. You've got to be able to follow along on the chart to know in case something is going to happen live in the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, you actually segued into the other big topic, but uh, before we do that, I, I just want to add um, a lot of times you get into be doing a workshop. Um, if you play well as a sub or you play well as a uh, principal player, people will invite you to do workshops. And when you get into that process, stuff's changing every minute. Like you mm -hmm. have to be able to read then. Yeah. Uh, or if the people like the way you play and they invite you on the session or whatever, you, it's going to become apparent that you can't read. So you still need the skill. Yep. Um, Absolutely. So you, you brought up the, the big, the big thing, Larry, which is 
for people who don't know this, there's one person who controls your destiny when you come in. Well, as a sub for sure, but uh, also in picking who they want to be in the rhythm section, and that's the conductor. Mm -hmm. So if you guys could talk a little bit about um, the skill of working with a conductor and how you get comfortable with working with a conductor and what they're listening for. So, at, Sean, you want, Larry, actually, yeah, Larry, you take that one first and then we'll go around. Okay. Um, the thing that I've learned uh, over working with many conductors is that they're all different. They all have a different style. Some of them are not even schooled or trained as conductors. They come up through the ranks and have developed their own style of conducting. So what you have to do is be instantly able to read what they want. You have to read their mind. They're not gonna be able to tell you most of the time. They're just gonna expect you to know. And so you have to figure it out within that first couple measures, especially if you haven't worked with a conductor before, where their downbeat is, what, they, what it means when they want you to go faster or if they want different dynamics from you. Um, and, and, and you have to always make the conductor comfortable because the, if the conductor isn't comfortable, everything's gonna go wrong. That conductor has no power with that little baton that they're using up there. If the drummer isn't right with the conductor, then the whole band isn't going to be together. And then the whole band won't be with the stage. So it's super important to have these, like, it's like a sixth sense you have to have to be able to mind read and absorb it immediately. 100%. Sean? And, and then, the other thing is you have to, um, you have to make them feel like you're with them at all times. So you always got to be staring at them. And I know it's harder now because sometimes we're in a different location and we're looking at them on a monitor, but the conductors can tell if you're looking where you're looking in, in the booth usually. But, um, you know, when I was first subbing, I would try to memorize as much as I could so I could just be staring at them so that even if it's the right tempo and they feel like it's wrong or something feels different, if they try to move it a little bit, you can just, you, they know you're with them. And sometimes it's, it's moving it so slightly or even not at all, just to make them feel like you're, you're with them and that they can go anywhere they need to go. Right. There's so many great questions coming in. We're not going to be able yeah, to talk. Uh, Gary, give, um, give us your, uh, um, you know, very quick things about playing with a conductor. Oh, we can't hear you. <laughs> um, can't hear oh, you. Uh, your microphone must be muted or something. How's that? Yeah, there, there you, you are. are. Okay. Um, yeah, I would say what Sean just said is absolutely key. I think. I think, um, you know, if you're playing drums for a show or probably you guys, everybody knows. Oh, oh, man. Oh, no. All right, we're officially gonna have to have Gary back on. We'll have all this, we'll have this uh, yeah. <laughs> so we can get to it. Um, this is a good question that I wanted to get to next. That's why I, I put it up. But uh, oh, interesting, sure. one of the things that I said to just tag on is that, you know, you, with the conductor, it's like you have to, Make it feel the way they want it to feel, but make it sound and feel like it was all your idea. That's kind of the way I describe <laughs> it. Yeah. You know, and, and you can't um, jump too fast. Like if if it looks like they're trying to go faster, don't you can't just like bounce to a new tempo. You have to gradually do it, or it's gonna the whole show is gonna notice. Right, right. And when you're subbing, especially and you're a little on edge, it's hard to not yeah. be like, oh my god, he want you know he wants me to change, and yeah. then you're yeah. Um, uh, but anyway, um, Peter's been. Uh, and I'm sure you gents know Peter, he's been yeah. a great uh, attendee at all of our uh, yeah. SEN sessions. A lot of times now we're playing in a booth and we're not necessarily in the pit, but still you have to play with dynamics. I know particularly Larry, your show come from away, even though you're in a booth, dynamics are still huge. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, they set up the show that way on purpose. They want. They told me before they built the booth, they said, play this show as if you were on stage with the rest of the band, because the rest of the band have come from away. They're all visible on stage, but they couldn't have me on stage because I've got such a huge setup and I'd be way too distracting to the story that they're trying to tell with the actors. So they said, we're not going to use any compression on your mics. We're going to make it sound. We're going to use room mics at some point um, so that you will only have the overheads taking the sound of your entire kit. We, we want it to sound like an acoustic instrument that's there on stage with us. So that was a very different setup than most shows are when, when they're in a booth. Mm -hmm. But it's very difficult to do as well when you're in a booth and you think, oh, I can just let it all hang out and go for it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Gary, what about you? Sorry about all the trouble you're having here. This is, oh, we can't hear you again. Oh. Uh... Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. 
Okay. Sorry, uh, it's a hard wire connection. I don't know what's happening. Hmm. Um, at any way, at any rate, I was just going to add on what Larry said. Is really that's really cool that they gave you the overheads and the room mics because when I was doing Tarzan, Phil Collins was there every day. It was great. And and what Phil Collins said to me in the very beginning is like, look, man, don't a lot of this music don't play like you would play as if you were in a theater. You really need to just hit it hard all the time. I want you to slam, you know, really hit hard all the time. In other words, it's the polar opposite of what Larry just said, because my my innate thing would be to play like I'm playing the room and playing, you know, musically with the people around me and for the moment. But Phil Collins was like, no, 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 it's got to be locked in, hit hard pop music. So it was a very different take. And actually, to be honest with you, I've been confused ever since. <laughs> well, I, mean, like, I mean, depending on the music, I, I'm saying that kind of kidding, but like yeah. School of Rock, I hit hard all the time. You know, Joe, you suffer me. Uh, but, um, you know, if it's another show, maybe not. I don't know. Sean, what's your take on that? Well, I, don't know I was going to say, I, I, I feel like a lot of the, the booths I've been, I've been designed to make it sound more like a studio sound. Yeah. So, so I've been, then I've, I really tuned for the mics and make sure everything's right. like getting a good recording sound. and. Also, it, the difference between that and being in the in the pit, obviously, you can play harder than you would if you were surrounded by musicians and people worried about the volume. So it makes you, if you need to get a, a full rock sound, you can get a, a better sound because you're you're able to hit harder and get the full sound of the drums without worrying about anyone else. But the important thing to do is when you're setting up the show in previews and rehearsals, is to give the full range of dynamics so that they're adjusting your mics in the house on the soft sections, so they know you're going to be playing soft as well. But then when you're going to play a huge song you're going to be really playing loud so you got to give them all the all the range at the beginning right i do you have a quick one last point to that yeah because i i subbed for sean on spam a lot and the, the drum set was in the pit there it was a very small pit and you were basically almost <laughs> underneath the conductor yeah you were i mean you you had to stare up like this and the way they built the plexiglass around the drum set for sean it wasn't very soundproof, and mm -hmm. the rest of the the sound team, whoever decided it, didn't want very much sound, live sound from the drums. But you still had to play with the intensity and energy that you were playing at a forte while you were maybe at a mezzo forte. Mm -hmm. so you've got to have the full range of dynamics in that's your right. tool bag. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. That I think that's a really good skill set to come away with. Yeah, you have to be able to play if you're doing if you want to do theater stuff. You need to have, you need to be able to play the room. I mean, yeah, it's a luxury to be able to hit hard in a, in a studio soundproof room like we have a lot of times now. But I think uh, the only way, I know the way that I got into the whole scene is from knowing how to play musically. And what Larry said, with intensity, without the volume, I subbed at Spam a lot for Sean too. And I remember that, yeah. He was right. The conductor was right, and he didn't want to hear it. Todd Dell didn't <laughs> want to hear much drums when, you know. But he needed it there to support everything all the time. Well, and the other thing is, when you're developing these shows, it's a workshop or a reading, which could be just drums and piano and no microphones in a small studio. So you have to play so soft. So I always tell people, like for Frozen, for example, it's basically two shows. There's a show I played in all the workshops, playing really small, to kind of working out my parts in my head, and then we get to the pits, a whole other show because. You're, it's almost like stadium rock in, in sections. And if you had done that in the workshop, you would have been fired because it would have swallowed up the entire room. Excellent. So you, you have to be able to play so soft, but make it sound like a produced studio sound. Yeah. yeah. We're going to, we're not going to get to all these great questions. You guys are going to have to come back. We have to, <laughs> I, I wanted to address this interesting question from Andy and Larry, maybe you could take it first. What do you think about this? Do you, are there times where you have to bring the conductor back? That's kind of a, it could be touchy, right? Oh, it's very touchy. Uh, because, but the answer is yes. Yeah. And question, Andy. Uh, absolutely, because not all conductors know that they have good time or not good time. They just know what it should sound like, and they might not be showing what they actually want it to sound like. So, if they're actually rushing and speeding up or whatever because they got really excited and all the dancers are on stage in the big production number, but you know that that section has got to be at one twenty, and the rest of the the band and the ensemble are counting on you to keep it there. That means you can't quite follow what the conductor might be showing mm -hmm. and you might keep it back, but you're staring right at him and you're smiling and looking and, and you're with him and you're like, I got you man or woman, you know, whatever. We're right there. We're together and keep their confidence up 
and keep the whole show together. It's, it's a really tricky thing, but it's very important. Good question. Man. It's it's hard with, with subconductors because every show has like five or six conductors. So they're all going to be slightly different. But a lot of times, I mean, it's always great to have a great relationship between the conductor and the drummer. So a lot of times when they're getting ready to do their first show, they'll come to the drummer and they'll say, they'll, they'll so a lot of times they'll say, if I'm off, just go where it normally goes because I don't want to, to mess anything up. So I'm going to trust you to help me keep all the tempos where they normally are on obviously where there's no click going. Um, and so I always, I always appreciate that when you have a nice relationship where you can talk about those kind of things instead of them coming down and saying, wherever I put it, you go with me. And I have had those situations where maybe you do that just because they're trying to prove something. So you go with them and see if, and sometimes people notice, sometimes they don't. Sometimes it feels like it's double speed and no one ever says anything. Uh, right. It's it's funny because a lot of this stuff, when it comes to the cues and things like that, we haven't talked about following conductor cues, which can also train wreck things. And um, those can be snap decisions. I, you know, I, I've subbed a lot more than I had a chair, but when I, when I subbed, I, there's shows I subbed at for 10 years and they had a new conductor. And even I, as a sub knew that this tempo wasn't right. And then it becomes a question of, okay, and certain personalities like it when you lock it down. Uh, and I would actually get to know who those personalities were. Like they like it when I plant it and they're, they're going to trust me. And then other people don't like it. So there's all this stuff that, go, you know, and that brings me to, I just want to put this question up and Gary, I'm going to give this one to you first. Because there's a lot of pressure on Broadway. Let's face it. Oh. Uh, is a performance anxiety ever a factor for any of you guys? Thanks, Frank, for that. Um, you're asking me? Yeah, you start with that one. <laughs> well, um, let's see. I, you know, if I think back in the days when I was subbing, yes, 100%. But at the same time, you have no choice. Because you're suddenly driving, you're flying the plane, you're driving the the bus, everything. I like Dave Radicek, who was a great drummer, uh, friends of ours, who passed away, sadly. He said something in an article I read once, and he said, you know, I, what I like to think about is that I'm the bus, I'm driving the bus or the vehicle, and my objective is to get success, bring all these people successfully from point A to point Z. And I have to say the last few years, ever since I read that, I keep that in my back of my mind. So getting back to anxiety, you know, there's kind of no room for that, really. I mean, you have to, I ha I feel that definitely at times I'm nervous, you know, but uh, it goes, it has to go away because I come right back to the fact that, no, I have a responsibility. And my pl I'm playing at my best when I'm in real time, you know, that kind of zenning out, and definitely. And I think one skill set for Broadway, you know, what, what I was thinking about when you're talking about conductors and subconductors and everybody's different um, perspectives all the time, you have to be really open and somehow aware of all this stuff and not let it get to you. So it really takes a chameleon in the moment. Um, so I think it kind of led from that, but you know, I mean, I wanted to get back, I wanted to tie that into the anxiety portion of it. Yeah, Sean, go ahead. Well, like what Gary was saying, even if you do feel nerves as a sub, you can't sound like it. So right. if you have to tell yourself, okay, play super behind, even though I'm gonna have natural anxiety to play a little faster maybe, play super behind so that you're right where you think where it's gonna be right. Cause you just, that's the one thing people don't want. They don't want a sub that sounds nervous or jumpy or, or rushing. So when you're nervous, you gotta really be able to control that. I, I guess it just comes from experience of, of, of doing it a bunch so that your first time you're subbing, you're really nervous and it gets goes away each time you play. Do you, Sean, do you feel, and all you guys actually, I, I always felt like that because I would get very nervous from my first, you know, after subbing shows, you know, I always equated it to like getting a shot as a kid. First time I got a shot, I wasn't that scared because I didn't know what it feel like. But then after a while, I was just scared of getting a shot. So I would be nervous the first time in, but I felt like a lot of conductors could separate. And um, I'll use Alex Lackamore as an example. Alex, like, I feel like Alex can tell if you're ner like. You're a little nervous at your first time, but he knows you're prepared and he mm -hmm. gives a little leeway for that. Like he gets it. He's, he knows you're, so he hears, he can separate what is ang a little bit of nervousness and a little, you know, and that it will go away. And as long as it goes away, you're okay. It's not like you're going to get axed in, in the first time if you're a little right. on top of a couple tunes, right? Yeah. Well, there's a difference between making a nervous mistake and making a mistake being in the lost in the form of a song. Like that's, that's what I always get mad with other rhythm section musicians when they're, making mistakes that are like, 
I don't care if they're nervous. They're just, like they're just not even in the right spot. That's not a nerve thing. That's they don't know the music. Right. Right. Yeah, that's a really good point. Here's a good question from uh, Wes Ostrander. Hey, Wes, a uh, uh, former student of mine. Do you try to emulate the setup of the person you're subbing for at home? And I think Gary mentioned this in passing when you're preparing or just get used to it in there when you get there. So Larry, what do you think about that? I can take that. Yes, absolutely. You have to. <laughs> and Sean, you know, alluded to this earlier with just spatial awareness of where the instruments are because a drum set is not one instrument and every key is already right here and every button or whatever, every instrument setup is gonna be vastly different. And you have to really know, there's a symbol, there might be a symbol way over here behind you, that's where the China symbol is. And you've gotta know where that is in your body because you don't have time to look in the dark pit and say, oh, here it is. Oh, where am I in the music? Oh, the conductor wants me to do something. <laughs> you've, got, you've gotta have it in your body. So recreate the setup as close as you can and I've done even crazy things when I didn't have access to certain instruments. I've made instruments out of cardboard or pots and pans or whatever. If I was in my apartment and I needed to have 17 cowbells, you know, to sub on West Side Story, I would put things there in those places so that I always knew that's where I was going to be putting it. That's where that instrument was. Super important. Mm -hmm. I would have to say that, uh, Sean, I haven't subbed for you, but having subbed for the other two gentlemen here, that preparing a sub is also a huge skill. And um, I know Larry and Gary, and I'm sure you too, Sean, are, are very helpful. They're both do everything they can because they know what you're going to feel like going in. Uh, and that's a really important uh, thing to, to be aware of. I remember when at my show, which didn't last very long, unfortunately, when I sent in my first sub, I I actually went to sit in the audience because I knew the show was going to close and I wanted to just hear it. I was so nervous. Like I didn't realize that I was nervous having my first sub in that he would do a good job, but thankfully he did. What do you guys think? And let's, um, I want to get to this before we get too tight on time. When things do get back to whatever is going to be normal with Broadway after we get back to it, you guys talked about coming in, subbing, kicking butt, and then it, you rose through the ranks and got shows. Um, is that still the way it's going to work? Is that is that still the way in you come in? And what advice do you have for the person who's just out of school, they moved to New York and they want to network with you guys and maybe get into the queue of these great drummers that want to get on Broadway? What's the way in nowadays? And let's assume for the moment that we're going to get back to normal at some point. Larry, you start and we'll go around. Yeah, it's largely still the very same thing. It's going to be based on who you know and whether people – like you and you, you seem to have your act together, they've heard you're playing or they've heard from people who know who, who they've played with that have recommended them to you. It's very, very much, it's so competitive. It's very, very much of who you know and what you've done and does somebody believe in you enough to take a chance on you? Because we might get called, you know, 20 times a week from 20 different players all wanting to sub for us or looking to break in somehow. And you just have to be very um, persistent, very positive, very nice, very professional, and bring all the chops that we've mentioned this whole hour, you know, with you to that. Mm -hmm. Gary, you next. Oh, okay. I, I think Larry, hundred percent. I'm getting a phone call. <laughs> um, it's Andy wondering if you're going to buy us drinks or not. <laughs> uh, yeah so what larry said is true i uh, i don't know if the first thing i'd say is it's his i don't know if it, the first thing i'd say is 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 about who you know i don't i don't know about that but i guess maybe for all intents and purposes that's important um i like to think that maybe somehow it's a little more organic than that anyway but yeah i don't really have much to add i, I do think it's i do think it's the same skill set when and if you know, so if someone calls me and I've heard good things about them and I like their rapport on the phone, they're not too overbearing. I feel like their pedigree is right and they've taken, you know, and, and the skill set changes, frankly, depending on what show you're, you're playing, you know, like um, skill set for Tarzan is really different from the skill set for Miss Saigon or whatever, you know, it's a lot of different, it's always different. That's what I love about Broadway. It's such a huge range of things out there. So I may think person X is amazing in a rock capacity, and I may think person X would be the worst possible choice to play drowsy chaperone or spam water or whatever, you know, so 
that's what I have to say. <laughs> yeah. you know? Sean, what about you? Well, Larry says something. He said the word nice. And I think that's so important now is being nice because yeah. we meet so many people online now through Facebook and to people right. um, calling us and writing us. And you can tell right away who is thinking, um, I want to learn from this person. Or I would love to meet this person or the people that are like, I want to suffer them tomorrow. I could do this, you know, um, right. and you can really, you, you get that vibe when they come to watch it. So I always think it's so important to be nice when you go to watch people because they're having you into their space. And I love having people watch me because that's how I meet people. And I've, a lot of people I've recommended for gigs based on them watching me um, at, at shows I played. And um, the other thing is, um, it's uh, wait, we were talking about Larry said being nice and being persistent. Oh yeah, the persistent thing. You don't want to you don't want to bug people too much either. And the most important thing is getting recommendations from other musicians besides drummers. Right. I I got a lot of subbing work from bass players and guitar players that I would do maybe a free gig somewhere. I did a, a free charity gig with the guitar player from Rent one time, and he said, you know what, you're gonna come sub at Rent. The next week I was there watching because he had told the drummer to call me. And so you never know where these where these um, links are going to come from. So you, you got to be nice to everybody and play your best and do as many other gigs as you can. And hopefully one of those gigs is going to lead to Broadway somewhere. Mm -hmm. yeah. Having having other musicians um, recommend you to the other to the you know even if a drummer doesn't know you at a show that's that's how I got a break to do moving out. But the the way I started doing and and a lot of the musicians are moving out were touring rock musicians. It wasn't necessarily a lot of people who who were doing shows. There were some, but the way I got more work was the a lot of those guys told people at other shows you should you should check out Joe. And no one knew me in, in, for any Broadway show. So having those other musicians recommend me was so important in my case. That was, and and I would also have to say that you guys um, who have shows like the word gets around among drummers. Uh, as well, wouldn't you guys agree for for your sub? So, oh, yeah. for instance, um, Gary and Larry, I've known you guys a long time, and you know, was honestly was always like, I'm not going to bother those guys about subbing. They've been doing this forever, and you know, eventually something came across your radar, like Gary in your case, School of Rock, and you're like, hey, maybe Joe might be a good fit. So you knew about me. I didn't have to bother you like every day. Right. So there's a line to be towed. You don't want to be too pushy because that can be a real drag. You That's know, cool. I. I would think. Totally true. Yeah. Larry, go ahead. For that too. Um, you have to do really good work no matter what you're doing and no matter where you're trying to go. You, your ultimate goal may be to play on Broadway, but the, but your path to that might not be just bugging all the guys who are playing Broadway shows and have the chairs. It'll be because you're willing to do that gig that Sean said, you know, with, with somebody else who might know somebody who's going to really like you on that session and re recommend you to someone else and then you've got a gig through six degrees of separation so you really have to be just doing your best at all times the gig you're on is the most important gig you never know who's going to be in that room listening to you right absolutely um and what i was looking for another question up here um from my student aj this is a great question um and this could go if you're subbing or not subbing. This could be if you're a um, principal show. If there's a style that you don't fully understand, how would you go about learning the new style? That's a interesting. Um, Sean, you want to take that first? Yeah. Um, I mean, a, a lot of people are specialists in certain styles. So like when they were doing In the Heights, Alex wanted someone who had experience playing Latin music to, to originate it. Um, so, so I probably wouldn't be called to originate a, a Latin show, but if you're subbing on a show, and you want to learn the style, you you can copy everything they're doing, but you want to know why they're doing it. So that's why you need to know these styles. Yeah. So you're not just copying them. You want to be able to play it authentically. Right. Um, one of the hardest things I had to do was I, start, I started subbing for Gary on drums, but after a while I started subbing on the percussion book too for, for Dean Thomas, and there was tabla in that book. And um, I'd never touched a tabla. So luckily he let me borrow some so I could practice. And that's an, that's one of the times in my life where I learned just enough tabla to get by to play that show. Cause that's like a whole lifetime you could spend learning that. Um, so I didn't have time to take like full tabla lessons, but in terms of styles, most of the Broadway shows are going to be a, uh, a condensed form of the style. Um, it's true. So you're going to, you just want to know why they're playing what they're playing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Larry, you had something. Yeah, I mean, on that you, there are many times when, especially when you're subbing or you're creating a new show, where you might not play that style of music for the entire show because it's 
a, a show that's made up of all different kinds of songs. Like there might be one song that's a bossa nova and the next song is a full big band swing song. And the next song is, a, is an eighties pop song. You've gotta be able to play passably in those styles. It just has to be enough so that it's a, uh, it feels authentic. You don't have to have lived out on the, you know, playing in an eighties rock band or something on the road or whatever. <laughs> play that one song in that one show. Right. Um, I'll Gary, yep. One real fast thing. I like what Sean said about the why. Um, why are you? Why is he playing it that way? You know, like I think that's really important. You know, like if if you're playing, if Sean's playing something and I'm subbing for him, and he, there's a fill and it, it sounds really cool to me, and I'm like, then I I might realize, well, the reason the reason he hit the snare drum there at that volume is because the guitar, the t both guitars are playing that. And there's a trumpet hit or something, whatever. So it's it's really getting in between the cracks a little bit, for sure. You know, it's about why often, not not just replicating what was played. You have to, you know, it's it's really about listening. We haven't talked about that that much, but it really does distill down to listening in a big way. Yeah, great point. What what do you guys think about? There was a couple of questions related to this, Sean. I know you control the click track at your show. So, mm -hmm. um, what, as far as like being conversant with technology. I've seen books where it's old school, it's a small drum set and a bunch of percussion things. And then there's other shows that are full V drums and other shows like, you know, Gary, the times I've been in for you, you've had electronics. So how, how important and how much of an expert do you need to be with electronics nowadays? Who wants to take that first? Oh, I'll go. Sean, go ahead. Um, so, so a lot of times there's a person that's hired as a programmer for the Ableton stuff and the synth stuff. So you have help. You don't necessarily have to be the one inputting data into the computer, but it helps if you can understand it so you can have conversations with these people. And a lot of times for sounds like uh, samples in a workshop, their programmer might not be there every day. So there's times where like, I want a, a horse whip there. So you go online, you get a horse whip import. You, to be able to know how to do that is so helpful. But the click stuff, um, you, you have to be able to, it's, you can't be scared of technology because you got to know your way around the system. So if something goes down at Frozen, I know how to jump or switch to the backup or jump to another section. And that's hard, that's a lot to ask of subs too, but hopefully I've, I've trained them to where they could do that. But um, yeah, just, you can't be scared of the technology. Mm -hmm. That's a great thing. Um, as we get down to the end here, I want to ask you, and I'll start with you, Larry. So um, we've been sharing so much information through Sabian and we're all here because of Sabian and we're so thankful that they've supported all of us. Larry, what, what brought you to Sabian and what keeps you with Sabian? Mm -hmm. Oh man, how much time do I have? You have like a minute, you have like 60 seconds. <laughs> I was a kid and I was looking for a certain sound for a certain symbol and I couldn't find it in any of the existing symbols. And I went to my local shop and they said, hey, there's this new company called Sabian in Canada. They're really great. They're really looking to provide symbols for whatever a drummer is hearing. And they literally called up the factory and said, hey, I, we got this kid here. He wants a symbol like this. Do you got something like that? They wow. said, yeah, we'll send it right down. Two weeks later, there was a symbol, the sound that I had in my head, I was hooked for life. That's awesome. Yep. Gary, with all the shows you've done, all the different styles, everything you've been called upon to play, you stayed with Sabian all these years. Yeah. What you find, you always find the sound you need for I everything feel, with Sabian. 100% of the time, and it's just getting better. I feel like the new stuff is really on fire. I love it. I'm happy all the time. Sabian, That's great. Sabian has, uh, everybody's been so nice. Whenever I dealt with them, Person to person, it's 100% helpful and fun and interesting. And couldn't say, I couldn't ask for anything more. I feel I feel very grateful. And it, thank you guys. It's it's great to have all you guys as endorsers. And Gary, we used to, you know, subbing for you, we would we would geek out about which models you were putting up and trading. Oh, it was really? so, wow. Yeah. Yeah, there was a lot of symbols on School of Rock. Well, it was great. It, it kind of looks great. like your, your setup there in back of you. Yeah, yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm an addict. What can I say? We, we could start the symbol addict group. Yeah. Sean, as as a, um, been with us a long time now, but um, more towards the newer side. Mm -hmm. What you know? What are there any symbols in your setup that you're really loving? Any lines that really brought your attention to Sabian? Well, um, the first stuff I tried at, at the Book of Mormon were the evolution um, crashes, and and those were beautiful there. But my new favorite thing is the complex line. Um, at Frozen, I was using um, legacy crashes. So I had a custom 20 and then a 19. The 20 was um, an inch bigger than they make. So, and I love those. But once they sent the complex 20 and 19, it's like the, the perfect crash sound. And 
I think it's like, I think it's the best thing they've ever made. It's really, they're beautiful to play and they, everyone loves them. Yeah, that's great. We, um, Sabian is going live at, uh, at two, um, with Mark Reynolds, our education band and orchestra, um, coordinator and Bob Breithoff. So we're going to wrap things up, but guys, I think there's a lot of questions unanswered. So if, uh, if you don't mind me um, taking another hour of your time in the very near future, I think we're going to have to come back and, oh, yeah. and uh, address a lot Great. more of these questions. Um, Round two. Yes. But I just, I just want to say thank you so much. I could see this was definitely needed and, uh, and a lot of people really enjoyed it. And, Sean McDaniel, Larry Lelly, and Gary Seligson, I can't thank you guys enough for giving your expertise and your time. You're all such pros and such great people, and we're honored to have you with Sabian, and I'm uh, proud to call you guys friends and colleagues, and just want to say thanks for being with us. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for having us. And thank you. Thanks a lot. Really a pleasure. We'll, we'll bring you guys back on. So there's uh, another thing coming up if you guys want to stay on. As far as SEN, uh, Dom Famularo will be on with uh, Maxim Dioman from the Ukraine at uh, 2 o'clock on Thursday. And then we have our SEN roundtable. If anybody here watch, is uh, watching that hasn't checked out the roundtable, um, it's a very fun, very loose uh, answering questions and uh, kind of like a family meeting. That's every uh, Friday at 2. So that will be back on. If anybody is watching... Um, and they, they haven't joined uh, the Sabian Education Network, go to sabianed.com and sign up. And once again, Sean, Larry, and Gary, thank you guys. I really appreciate it. And we'll see you next time, okay? All right. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks, again. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Peace.